In today's video, I'm actually going to cover, um, which is pretty much just a crash course through um, real-time ray tracing in Unreal Engine, how to get your project set up for it, some of the prerequisites you'll need for it, and then um, hinting at a little bit of the tools available to you to debug and figure out why your scene may not be performing at optimal, uh, optimal levels and what you can do to correct that. So let's go ahead and jump in. So before we actually get started manipulating and building our environment using real-time ray tracing in Unreal, it's important that we have four very critical things ahead of time in order to take advantage of this technology. Uh, the first one being you have to have an RTX card, a card that uh, supports real-time ray tracing, which at this time that's any of the 20 series NVIDIA cards, the RTX cards. The second thing that you're going to need to have is making sure that your engine build is running 4.22 or higher. Now at the time of this recording, we're using 4.22.0. Uh, the third thing is making sure that your Windows build version is build 18.09 or greater. Now to do that, if you press the Windows R key to run a command and you type in winver and press OK, this will pull up your current version of Windows. Um, so right now we're running build 18.09 which is exactly what we need as a baseline. And finally, the fourth thing that you need is to force the engine into DirectX 12 mode, uh, which simply to do that, navigate to your engines folder, binaries Win64. Now, if you're using a marketplace build or source build, it will be the same location. And inside of this Win64 folder, you've got this ue4editor.exe. So if you right click on this and create shortcut, which I've done here on my desktop, right clicking on that shortcut, and opening the properties, this is how you force the engine into DirectX 12 mode. So under the target, which again is going back to our engine binaries Win64 folder, we can see here that we have that ue4editor.exe. And in there, I've added this text, dash DX12. Now there's a space between the exe, but it's dash DX12 will force the engine to launch in DirectX 12 mode. Now something very, very critical to note here, because um, I'm sure you'll probably have this happen to you, if you launch the project from the um, your library view in the UE4 launcher, it will not force the engine into DirectX 12 mode. You have to launch it from this shortcut. Now, I fully expect that Epic will change this in subsequent builds, but for right now, in order to view and take advantage of the real-time ray tracing capabilities, you have to force it into DirectX 12 mode. So by double-clicking the shortcut that you created with the dash DX12, if we highlight over here our project title, you can see that it is underneath the graphics RHI DirectX 12. Um, and that will, that will force the engine to run in DirectX 12 mode. So we've got those four things. The last thing that we need to do is in the engine under our edit project settings, should pop up here, um, underneath rendering, um, and you can type this in as well, but if you type in real time, actually, let's see ray tracing there it is so under this ray tracing all you need to do is check that and it'll pop up saying hey you need to start the editor and it will recompile all the shaders that is literally all you need to do to get the engine running with real-time ray tracing and your project updated as well um, now we'll go a little bit deeper into that here in a second but those are the pre uh, prerequisites that you need to get the engine running in real-time ray tracing now i'm going to tangent here for a second just to give you guys a little forewarning, um, I feel it's uh, my responsibility to help you avoid the pains that I've had. Um, if you'd noticed the past couple weeks, I've been a little quiet, no videos. The reason being is that I've actually been spending the past couple weeks completely rebuilding uh, Windows from the ground up. The reason for that is um, when real-time ray tracing came out and I found you had to force it into build 1809, I thought, okay, no problem. Windows has this out. It's supposed to be a stable build. I updated my machine and it just freaked out. CPU was pegged out. My graphics was acting really weird. Come to find out that some somewhere in that process of updating, surprise, surprise, Windows actually kind of corrupted itself, forcing me to actually have to go back from scratch and build everything from the ground up. So um, it's a huge pain. Um, I say that to say, I think the, the technology with real-time ray tracing is great. I think it's awesome. I think it's definitely the way of the future. But I just want you to be forewarned if you're thinking, hey, this is really cool. I'm thinking about doing this for my project and stuff. I would definitely weigh the pros 
of doing it and really ask yourself if it's necessary right now. Again, just purely from the fact of, you know, A, we've got to be forcing the engine into a DirectX 12 mode. Support and compatibility for DirectX 12 is still, still very young. Um, and then, of course, the lovely issues with Windows being that this is like the most current release, which is prone to bugs. So, again, just a forewarning, um, I, would, I would feel bad if I... If I recommended you guys go the real-time ray tracing route and you had the headaches that I do. Um, again, all that being said, if you're still all in favor of it, um, absolutely. I think it's 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 an awesome technology and that's what we're going to dive into so we can kind of unpack how it works, what's really cool about it, and then what's what's changed from previous versions of the engine or previous you know builds of this technology. So with that being said... Um, Let's go ahead and jump in and we'll actually see the settings we can start manipulating on how to control real-time ray tracing. At this point, the engine's restarted. It's recompiled all the engines. And now we're actually starting to see some of the effects of real-time ray tracing. Uh, but of course, the big question is, how do we actually control that? Um, I will tell you that the, the first and foremost answer right now is your post-processing volume. That's really what's ultimately going to control uh, globally how your real-time ray tracing interacts with the world. So to do that, um, I've, I've got our post-processing volume that's already in here. Now, I'm not gonna cover the um, kind of the standard things that have been in the engine before, but really what I wanna do is highlight underneath the rendering features, there's some new things. Now, granted, this is very simple, very easy to figure out. Um, but we have all these new tabs called ray tracing and then some kind of parameter. So we've got ambient occlusion, global illumination, ray tracing reflections, and translucency. Um, there's also a uh, path tracing under here, but for the most part, these are going to be your primary controls. Now, I'm not going to dive deep on this video under, you know, what you need to consider with max bounces, the samples per pixel, um, so on and so forth. Um, there's a lot of documentation on that right now, but for the most part, just understand that, that this is ultimately where you're going to be controlling all of those effects and how the ray tracing uh, appears in your, um, in your actual level. So that's really about it. I mean, in terms of just your um, uh, ray tracing controls globally. So now that we're done with that, let's go ahead and jump over to the different lighting types and how you can control those effects um, with each one. So to start with, the first light that I want to actually cover is a directional light. So I'm just going to add one to our scene now. Because I'm repurposing this interior lighting, we're probably not going to see the effect of it. Um, but that's fine because, um, again, most, most of the light itself is exactly the same as it's been before. Granted, there's a couple new changes to it. So um, inside of um, the, the details panel of our directional light, there's a couple things that I want to make um, note of. Now, um, if you haven't expanded this out, you'll probably see your light and you'll see all the parameters with it, but there's this little kind of upside down triangle. And if we click that, uh, this is what's actually going to pull up some of the more advanced settings for that light. Now in it, there's one in particular that we need to be very cognizant of, which is this cast ray trace shadows. Now, I believe by default it is on, uh, but you just need to make sure that that is checked um, in order to cast those shadows. Now, you'll see this exact same parameter in pretty much all the other lighting types that, we, uh, that we'll go through, but just be aware that that is how you activate those real uh, ray trace shadows, which if I take a second just to kind of briefly mention something here um, as you're going forward with ray trace ray tracing lights and ray tracing scenes there is nothing that says just because you activate real-time ray tracing that you have to use it for your entire scene um, you can use a hybrid method which is actually something I highly highly recommend uh, from a performance standpoint so you don't have to have all of your lights casting real-time ray trace and you can have baked lights you can have those that don't cast ray trace shadows and then a few of them that do to just highlight in the areas that are important so uh, but just be aware that this is how we activate those ray, those ray trace shadows now okay so how do we actually get the effect with um, our directional light and of course with our other lights that we'll see um, in terms of making those shadows look more realistic uh, that is actually going to be our source angle so as we adjust this up and down, and I'll show you on a spotlight where it's a little bit more visible, but that source angle is ultimately it's going to soften your shadows or make them more precise, more hard edge. So with the directional light, it's cast ray trace shadows and your source angle. Okay, 
I'll go ahead and delete this guy. And then let's uh, let's actually cover spotlights real quick, um, as well as point lights. So I'm just going to click one of these that's in the scene. Now again, this is set to static um, as opposed to stationary. Um, but in here, we've got some of the same settings that we saw um, in our directional light. So if I scroll down, you'll see that we have cast ray trace shadows on. And then to adjust how this light actually affects um, the world and how we see those um, uh, the, the real-time ray tracing shadows that's going to be the same thing here in our um, source radius um, soft source radius source length um, and I believe that should cover um, the spotlight in terms of helping to soften those shadows and make them more precise uh, so again some of these things have been in there before I believe the um, soft source length I could be wrong here I think that is the new parameter that has been added uh, with real-time ray tracing. So that's how we do that. Let's jump over real quick to a point light. Um, and we can see here, same thing, source length, source radius, soft source, and our cast ray trace shadows. So um, if I actually, you know, let's do, we'll, I'll, I'll add one in here real fast and we'll see. So in particular, I'm gonna be taking a look at these, uh, the shadows that are being cast from this pipe. So if I go here to my source radius and I take this up, this is where you can start seeing um, the softening effect here. So we'll take a uh, soft source up even more. So effectively what this is, is that, that kind of that yellow indicator is what would theoretically be the bulb size. So right, like if I took it down to zero, you're talking about like an infinitely fine point. So that's why we're gonna get those really, really hard shadows. But if I take it up and make it, you know, like a, a very, very large diffused bulb, that's why we're gonna get these soft shadows. So again, source radius, and our cast ray trace shadows. That's that's pretty much it. Um, so we'll go ahead and delete that guy. We'll get him out of here. So that should cover our directional lights, our spotlights, and our point lights. The um, fourth light, now I've got a fifth one that'll cover here, but it's a little bit different. But the fourth light um, is something that's been in there before, which is this rec light, which is short for rectangle light. So if I drop this in there, you can see um, before you used to just have kind of a cube. Um, that's pretty much the same. That's what this inner square is. The outer ones are what's considered a barn door. Now, a barn door is actually from the cinematic world, the film world, that allows you to kind of put some, they, they look like doors, on an actual light. Um, so that's kind of the newest addition with the rectangle lights, but fundamentally underneath, they're very much the same rectangle light that's been there before. So I'm gonna delete this guy real fast because I've already put one in here to show you. Um, so with this rectangle light, um, we're going to have the same thing, which is our source width, which is going to expand this guy out, source height, which is going to elongate it, and then there's this barn door angle, which again, um, it's kind of cool. I mean, this is a nice part about, you know, actually seeing it in real time. You can see what happens with it, but if you notice on the wall, this is where we're starting to get some of that um, diffusion in the light, um, and that's pretty much it. So um, I'll actually, um, I'll highlight this real fast, so source width and height pretty much goes back to the same principle that we had with the point light. Um, so if we look at the shadow that's on, I'll go into game mode real quick just so we can see this. Um, the shadow that's on this, this sign that's here, how we kind of got that nice soft diffusion. If I take our source width down, same thing source width height. So I'm essentially just making that a very, very fine point, uh, which actually we'll activate game mode here. You can see we now get that very, very crisp hard shadow. But then again, if I start taking this up, source height, you can see we now start to get it more diffused. Um, again, that is very much, I mean, very consistent across all the different lighting types. Source width, um, source radius, and then our real-time uh, cast ray trace shadows. And that's pretty much it. The rest is, is pretty much all the same lights you've known and you've come to love with Unreal Engine. Okay, so I did say that there was um, a fifth one, which is a skylight. Again, this is something that, you know, is, is used in a lot of projects, um, and it kind of simulates an environment being cast into it. Uh, but there is an option with skylights, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this is somewhat supported. I don't think it's fully ray trace supported right now. I could be wrong. Uh, but with that, all you have is in the roll-up, so again, this is kind of by default, if you expand this out, there is this cast ray trace shadow. So if you turn that on, that will do it. But if you notice, we don't really have any sense of scale or you know, skylight size. Um, it's pretty much just a flag that says, go ahead and cast ray trace shadows. Um, and that is it. So that covers all the different lighting types and how to activate your real-time ray tracing with those lights um, in the engine. So with that, 
we're going to move on to the next step, which is kind of debugging ray tracing a little bit to find out, you know, hey, what's happening? Where's performance bottleneck? So on and so forth. So let's go ahead and jump into that. So in the engine, there, there's always been this GPU profiler. Um, and we've also got stats that we can look at as well. But with the addition of real-time ray tracing, we've got a few things that have been added to that. So the first thing that I want to do is if I press Control shift and comma, this will actually pop up the GPU visualizer. Um, and really what this is doing is just capturing a single frame of what's happening to kind of break down the subcomponents of everything involved with rendering that frame. So if I expand this scene out, this kind of shows you all the different passes that the engine goes through to render an image on screen. Now with it, what you'll see with your ray tracing is this ray tracing reflections. Um, and I believe there's a, there's a couple other things that pop up as well. But if you notice, um, this, this is why, going back to a comment I made earlier about, you know, using a more hybrid approach um, is definitely, definitely, definitely recommended, um, is because of this. If you notice down here in this re, uh, ray tracing reflections, even though currently I'm running a RTX 2080, which is a good card, it's not the highest end, but it's certainly not the lowest end, I'm still getting about 20 milliseconds of frame time, which equates out to around 30 frames a second for what is a relatively light scene. And that is primarily due to this 20 seconds of milli, uh, 20 milliseconds of frame time for just my real-time ray tracing reflections alone. So this is a great place to start on just figuring out, okay, where are your costs on things? I could then use that information to say, go back into my, um, my global post-processing uh, post volume. Maybe I adjust some of the number of bounces. Maybe I adjust some of the parameters in there to help lighten um, each of our frame times to get better performance. Uh, but this is a great place to start for that. The second thing is to actually go through some of your stats. So um, if we use this little carrot kind of drop down, there is a stat field. Now, granted, there's a lot of stats that you can pull up, uh, but when it comes to just real-time ray tracing just out of the gate, there are a couple things that are kind of my go-to. Now, the first thing I want to do is my GPU. Uh, there's another one as well, which is scene rendering. And then I'm going to go to engine and I'm going to do unit. So we'll do that. We'll pull it up. Um, and so over this is the stat unit that's happening here, which shows me my frame time, my game time, which is the actual processing running for the game itself in terms of the game thread. Draw time, GPU time, which if you remember from our GPU profiler, that we had that massive 20 milliseconds of frame time just for reflection. So that's showing me what's being processed on the GPU. And then RHIT, which I believe is things directly related to real-time ray tracing, uh, you can see that's pretty high. So um, by using this one, we can clearly see that whatever I've enabled in the scene with uh, real-time ray tracing is adding a lot to my overhead. Um, and then finally going through our GPU stats and scene rendering, um, this is again, ha this has always kind of been in the engine, but there are some additional things added with ray tracing, which shows us, which is pretty clear, ray tracing reflections. Um, I believe there's some other ones that pop up here as well. Um, you know, ray tracing I mean occlusion. So you'll know a lot of what's happening here, um, but this is great for just you starting to debug your scene. Um, and that's kind of the, the debug mode for that. Okay, so now that we've kind of at least just stepped through just a few of the tools, there's way more that you could go in depth, but this is just a great great starting point if you haven't worked with stats or GPU and stuff like that. Um, so really the only last thing that I wanna cover is uh, when it comes to material setups. Um, so we'll jump into that real quick. I'm gonna go ahead and just open up this. Um, I've, I've kind of just created an example here just to show. Um, now this isn't going to cover how you go about setting up materials um, because truth be told, it's pretty much the same exact setup that you've done before with one caveat and that is this. When it comes to real-time ray tracing, um, a general rule of thumb when it comes to how you author your materials is, you know, if you kind of imagine this, this sliding scale where you've got you know, very, what would be considered dielectric materials, so not very shiny, very, you know, flat, matte, and then you've got these really, really reflective ones, you kind of want to stay away from this middle ground. Um, and the reason for that is when it comes to real-time ray tracing, it's kind of an all-or-not thing. So, you know, if you've got a, what is 
typically a very flat material, but with a slight bit of reflectivity, it's still going to be processing all of those, those bounces, all of the interaction with things, which can get very costly. So um, moving forward, if you know your project is going to be set up to be a real-time ray tracing to leverage that technology, really make sure that your materials are kind of pushing to one end of the spectrum or the other uh, because having this stuff in the middle ground just gets really costly and you're not really getting much of a visual benefit. Um, but outside of that, your material setups is going to be pretty much the same. Um, you're still going to author them the same way, base colors, metallic, specular, roughness, ambient occlusion, normals, displacement, nothing's really changed there. Um, really about the only things that's changed at this time. Now, granted, I um, I know from Epic and things that they have they have stated that there's going to be a lot more control going forward. But right now, really, the only thing that's that's critical in your material setups is this new node called Ray Tracing Quality Switch Replace. Um, and really what that does is it tells the engine um, you can set certain flags for whether it's assets, whether it's materials, um, whether it's global things, to be able to turn that ray tracing on or off. Now, granted, I don't believe you can do that per instance in the sense of, you know, your real-time ray tracing is going to run or it's not. But in terms of the material itself, you know, interacting with, you know, kind of the, the engine in the background that's processing the real-time ray tracing, you can tell it to say, hey, just ignore me, don't use me, which will help save you performance cost. And you do that through this ray tracing quality switch replace. Um, so really all that you have to do for this is um, you're going to have your normal material. So it's not a normal map. That's just what would be your normal material that you would create without real-time ray tracing. And then what is your material with ray tracing? Um, so you're going to plug those two in there. So ideally the way you would go about setting this up is that your normal material, you could have a little bit more complex, a little bit more robust uh, because it's using, again, the technology that's already been there that's not as expensive. And then you could have a material that's a little more optimized for ray tracing, but maybe takes advantage of that real-time ray tracing and you plug it into there. So you can simply branch it out. You can do break material attributes, set material attributes, break those two and then pump it back in. So this is definitely going to be something going forward that as you author materials, this is going to be very critical in your setups and something that I think will um, will definitely be a new um, new bit of tool set for material artists, um, uh, whether it's tech artists and stuff like that. This is going to be something that's going to be very, very critical for optimizing performance on you know systems that don't run real-time ray tracing and those that do. Um, Outside of that, I honestly don't have a whole lot more for material setups, um, again, because this is just such in its infancy right now. Um, but I, I do know that coming down the pipe are going to be a lot more tools um, to be able to make this you know, better optimized and give um, artists a lot more tool sets. So um, that kind of covers uh, at least the material setup. All right, so to conclude kind of just this, again, which is just a crash course in real-time ray tracing, um, these are the things that I, I think are very, very critical to consider beforehand moving on with a, um, a project and setting up for real-time ray tracing, and um, it is this. Obviously, system stability. Um, I think Windows needs to kind of catch up to the game a little bit. Um, you need to make sure that um, it, even at the time it's recording, in fact, I'm actually recording on a DSLR because I can't, um, I can't actually record on the machine outside of the NVIDIA GeForce because everything on the system when the engine is running DirectX 12 mode has to be DirectX 12 compatibility So um, or uh, compatible. So you've got to make sure you've got that compatibility with DirectX 12 on all your programs if there's a correlation with those. Um, the, the third thing is considering, you know, the performance cost with this. Again, I'm running on a very robust system right now um, with a 2080 card, and I'm still getting about 30 frames a second. So there's a lot of costs involved in doing this. Um, I fully believe this technology goes uh, further down. It'll get a little bit faster and streamlined, but right now it is very costly and very expensive. Um, you need to consider in engine the cost of your materials, uh, whether or not, you know, don't try to have anything in the middle ground, you know, have it either, you know, rough or super shiny. Um, try to avoid that, that middle ground. Um, considering the number of bounces that you're um, that you're going to have for all of your different lights, uh, for the reflections, um, so on and so forth, uh, translucent objects. Very very careful with those when using real time ray tracing. Those get very very expensive. Um, 
use your global pro post processing volume. That is pretty much your master control for everything that's happening with real time ray tracing in your engine. So that'll kind of be your first place to go to when it comes to optimizing and making um, making that real time ray tracing work better. Um, and then um, the second to last thing is absolutely use a hybrid approach to um, to building your lighting. And what I mean by that is, you know, consider, you know, absolutely use the um, the traditional um, lighting methods with baking lighting, um, you know, using things that aren't real real time ray tracing, and then kind of add splashes of those ray tracing. Um, effects in there or there's road tracing lights uh, to kind of just help boost your scene a little bit but absolutely don't go full bore and just have all ray tracing lighting that will just absolutely tank your performance so definitely use a hybrid approach and then finally the last thing is use the stats use the profilers uh, that is going to be absolutely critical um, in determining why the cost of things are so high um, um, that that's going to be absolute paramount so with that being said i i hope this helps i hope this kind of dispels some of the myths about you know how do i get real-time ray tracing in my project can i use it on an existing project what's the pros and cons of it um i hope i've at least covered all the bases for you guys if i've missed something if there's something you're not sure of absolutely drop a comment down um i'll i'll read that and i'll try to respond as best as i can i think one thing to remember though too is that you know this technology is still very very young um i definitely as as a professional absolutely agree that this is going to be um growing and moving in the future i think it's going to be something that's going to be very paramount to um, not only cinematic stuff but even games um, as a whole um, so this is going to continue to grow and it's going to become more robust a little bit easier to use uh, but for now it's still very very young so um, definitely consider very strongly if you're going to make the jump um, or create a project specifically for this platform um, so with that being said i hope this helped as always thank you guys for your support i really do appreciate it um, and i will catch you guys on the next one